I always like when I know someone, I do like to begin with a story. And I want to tell you the first time I met you. Do you remember when we first met and sat and talked? Do you remember that? It was a long time ago. Do you remember? Um, I remember seeing you in, in, in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that was I'm trying to think. It, it, yeah, I don't know what it was finals, like, something. It was something, yeah, some sporting. Yeah. yeah. And you sat with me, and I believe it was Rashawn Ali. You just happened to be there, I think, and I was meeting with Rashawn Ali. Do you remember yeah. that? Mm -hmm. Yep. And I thought to myself, what a lovely gentleman. Like how yeah. kind, how nice. And you and you know, you know the the rap on you, right? What people say about you, which is all the things, right? You're kind, nice, gentleman, always a good guy, somebody you can count on, dependable. Do you ever, for lack of a better term, feel a way about being called a nice guy all the time? <laughs> you know, no. I mean, I I think you know, it's not a, I can think of worse things to be called. Um, I, I, I found it amusing, I think, during my career, um, particularly in Detroit. You know, you got to understand, you're coming off of, at that time, the bad boys. And the bad boys were, you know, hugely successful. Uh, kind of get lost in the conversation during that era. You talk about the Lakers which I know you, you're a Laker fan. I grew up a Laker fan. Um, <laughs> with the Lakers and Celtics of the 80s. And then, you know, we forget about the Pistons and it goes right to the Bulls and Michael Jordan. But, you know, in Detroit, there was a real sort of pride, understandably so, for, for their accomplishments. And then all of a sudden, this nice guy comes. And I think sometimes people confuse nice with weak. And, mm. and, um, and so... That, you know, I won't say it bothered me, but it was it was one of those things where I was like, no, you can still, you know, be competitive. You can still, um, you know, you, you don't get to the NBA and get to an all star level without having, you know, a little bit of a nasty streak, a little bit of a competitive streak. Um, but we can be nice after we beat you. Like that was sort of the mindset and the attitude. And so but now, nah, look, I mean, I, I think the most important thing is to be authentic and to be who you are. And I've tried to do that. Haven't always been perfect, but I, I think it, I try to come from a, from an honest place. Which leads me to what I was going to say. There are tons of people who, who pretend to be tougher than they really are, right? And then there are those who pretend to be really nice in, in this business that we are in, um, and they're real assholes. And it <laughs> is the rare quality where you meet someone or where their reputation of being that person matches who they are. And for you, it has been that way in all rooms. And it's not just so much to give you your props, but for me, that's a, I feel like that's an honor and a great feeling because mostly people don't understand who other people are. And, and the perception is usually not true to who the character is. And for you, it matches. And I remember Chuck Charles Barkley telling this story. You can tell me if it's true or not, but we were at work um, and it was one of, you know, Chuck's infamous nights where he, he holds court in a bar. And uh, I think we might have been in Atlanta at the Four Seasons. And he was talking about money. It's when we were doing the show Arena. And it was, um, I believe it was Draymond, Chuck, you know, Tara, everybody, the crew. Yep. And he said, I remember Grant Hill's parents telling me, and, you know, I'm, by the way, the location may be wrong, but it was in a bar somewhere. Everybody talking. I do know that. <laughs> it, uh, there might not have been there, but it was somewhere around the world in a bar and Chuck was holding court. And he was like, I remember Grant Hill's parents telling me when you become really rich and you have money and you start to give it to family and friends, it's never enough. You do know that it's never enough. Do you remember him, your parents talking to Chuck about that and money and 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 what happens when you get into this? to this very extremely wild business of the NBA and you become multi, multi, multi millionaires and people can read about all the money you make. Do you remember that? I do. I do remember that. We, it was 1996. Uh, and coincidentally, it was in Atlanta at the Olympics. Okay. <laughs> and we were, um, we, we were at the, the Westin Hotel, or excuse me, the, yeah, the Westin Hotel. No, the Omni Hotel, excuse me, the Omni Hotel. I should know uh -huh. this. And, um, it wasn't a bar, but it was in the uh, in the eating area uh, during lunch. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, if it had been later in the night, it probably would have been. Yeah, correct. <laughs> but it was, uh, especially with Chuck. Um, correct. But no, I mean, 
my parents would just kind of post up there uh, in the in the cafeteria and, yeah, you know, yeah. just see family members, see players. And they spent a lot of time with with Charles. And it was really kind of cute to see them kind of bonding and particularly my mom with with Chuck. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm thinking, you know, here's my mom. Like, you know, come on now, like, you know, you, you're giving advice to Charles Barkley. Like, come on, mom. you know, and, and but it really resonated with him. And I've heard him say that. I've heard him say it to other people in my presence uh, and how it really impacted him. And so, you know, it, it just makes me realize and appreciate how how fortunate to, to have that kind of counsel and to have that support as I tried to navigate, you know, celebrity and fame and money and, and all the trappings that come with it. Um, you know, you know, one of the things my mom used to always say, uh, since we brought her up was, you know, when I was young, she would say this a lot and I didn't quite understand it, but she would say, don't feel, fa- don't fear failure, fear success, because there's more people who are ruined by it. Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, for me, you know, I, I needed to hear that and needed to sort of like understand, first of all, you know, um, you know, go, go for it. Don't, don't fear failing. Um, but also understanding what comes with success. And so whether in our industry and in television, um, you know, there's loads of examples of some of which you mentioned, we won't name names. Um, but I, I think through it all, just, you know, my parents and sort of my dad and, and his his career just tried to be, you know, we came of age or I came of age. I'm a lot older than you, but I came of age during the, the keep it real generation. Mm-hmm. And so to me, I interpreted that like, let me be real. Let me be who I am. Let me be authentic and not try to put on or act a certain way. And, um, and through it all, like, you know, I think I've done that. Like, I think I've tried to stay true to who I am and not be something I'm not. And, um, and really kind of be proud of that, you know, and, 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 and not, you know, like that's what differentiates you. That's what separates you in a lot of ways is, you know, your authentic self. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I remember Charles saying that, and um, and he talks about it a lot. And you know, look, even now, you know, my, my parents when, when when I'm with them, like they pick up the tab, and they, you know, I still when I would go see, my, like, I'd go visit my parents. Even now, like my mom would give me cash, <laughs> and, and and like the roles like didn't change. And so you know, I go to the ATM. I'm the generation. I go to the ATM. You get the twenty dollar bills. And my mom, you know, she's of the generation where they go in the bank. So she would give me, I would see her at games. We'd play the Wizards and, you know, they'd come to games. They live in the D.C. area. And she would give me like four or five hundred dollars in cash. And uh, and so it was really cool. And, I, you know, so I never have money or cash when I'm with my parents because they always pick up the tab. OK, so I got to talk about you for five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk about you. First of all, that's absolutely adorable. Second of all, that tells me a lot about your parents, which I'm going to get into in a second, because I remember when I would watch you playing in college, I the 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 storylines would be you're the next this and who your parents were and how the, the family that you came from. That was always one of the many storylines like you were. I don't know. You guys are the Huxtables, you know, right? I mean, like it was the way in which it was portrayed. Um, So for you to say that is really adorable. So I need to know, what have we bought our parents? Because I know you're not taking four and $500 from my homegirl like that all the time. Like you, I know you bought your mama house. Come on now. Don't be, don't act like they just out here giving you money. No, they wouldn't let you buy them. so, so, So my parents, so they moved into this house that, you know, when I was a senior in high school. And they've been in the house thirty plus years. Wow! I did. I did buy. Let me see. I bought my dad a car for his. Okay. I bought him a, a Mercedes in '97 for his fiftieth, and then I bought my mom. I did buy her a car at one point, an Escalade, I think. But that's it, you know. And so they don't, I mean, want, I, they don't want anything. Look, they they're insulted that if I were to pick up the tab or pay for something, oh, and so. Wow. You know, they're like, look, we got our own money. We don't need, you know, we don't need your your handouts. And so, um, but here's the thing. Here's the thing that was fascinating about that. Um, this whole conversation is fascinating. I don't know a black parent don't that don't be like, give me something. Like, this is right. fascinating. 
Well, I mean, I think I think it speaks to, to you know, look, they're achievers and they've they've had their own successes. And 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 um, and and so certainly I'm mindful of that and they're proud of that. Um, but also, you know, and, and I'm not trying to judge or, or I don't want this to come off the wrong way. But I think the fact that I've never like, you know, took care of them financially and I and I would I mean, I would if, if I needed to. But I think it's it's allowed for the relationship to be real and to be. Um, like they never, they never once have, have bitten their tongue. They never like, you know, had to bite their tongue or hold back um, or change the role of being a parent. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not perfect. And sometimes I, I miss, I make mistakes. Uh, I, I, do things that... I never <laughs> know. Yes, I don't believe I do. it. I don't yes. believe it. <laughs> my, my parents and my wife would tell you, yes, I make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> but, you know, they've always like, they've been able to be straight shooters with me and, you know, having people who tell you what you need to hear, I think is so important as we talk about navigating celebrity in life and they've always done that. And, and so I think if they were on the the quote unquote payroll, that, that might compromise that a bit. That might make it difficult. I'm not trying to say that that's the case for other people, but I just know, um, you know, money has not changed the dynamics of our relationship. And, um, and that's something I'm grateful for. You are, you, for those who are listening, he is making a very valid point that you can only understand it if you've seen it. So, so in this business, I started out working in terms of when I decided to go strictly into sports, I was working at the tennis channel and I would watch these literally no lie, 17, 18 year old kids who had lots of money and they would control their parents and their trainer and everybody else involved. And the parents couldn't really be themselves. The kids were running the house. They were yep. running the household because they had the money. The dynamic shifts when the person with the money is in control, right? Even in this case. So I do understand what you're saying. And I have seen the yes men and women around said celebrity, said athlete. And you're right. It changes how you all interact. I think, though, that is honorable. Mm-hmm. And I and by way of background, your father, he went to Yale, um, correct? He played yep. in the league, NFL, correct? Yep. Now, tell tell us a little bit about the pressure and also about your mom and what she did in her own accomplishments. Because that had to be a lot of pressure growing up um, uh, with these two these two parents who are achievers in their own right. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, look, my dad, you know, he, um, you know, my, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather had a, you know, second grade education. And so, you know, for him, he always emphasized, you know, the importance of education. And one thing my dad, you know, would always share was that, you know, my, my grandfather bought him some encyclopedias when he was a kid. And, um, and, and so anyway, education, and I think for that generation, I mean, education was obviously because it was denied to us. Sure. Um, it was all, you know, it was definitely emphasized. And then my dad won a scholarship to go to a boarding school, which he didn't want to go to, but his father made him go. And I think that really changed, as he would say, the trajectory of his life. And so now he arrives as a ninth grader and all these kids are talking about Ivy League schools. And, and so it was an Ivy League sort of prep school, which, you know, he excelled in sports and eventually went on to Yale. Um, and played in the NFL 13 years. And then my mom, you know, she came, grew up in the segregated South, you know, never, never really met or had a conversation with somebody white and then went to, you know, Boston, Massachusetts and went to Wellesley and was one of five black young women uh, at the school. And so that was a bit of a, of a culture shock, but, you know, I think for both of them, you know, being taken out of their comfort zone, um, in an education, educational environment in, in higher education and secondary education. Um, I think it really kind of opened their eyes and, and, you know, my mom went on and she had her own co- corporate consulting firm, um, for, for 30 years on Capitol Hill. And, you know, we, we, we joke, she, she's, uh, she's served on a number of corporate boards like Nextel, uh, Sprint, excuse me, Sprint, Nextel, Wendy's, the Carlisle Group. She went into the National Association of Corporate Directors Hall of Fame. And so she likes to say that, you know, that, uh, you know, we're not the only ones in, in the Hall of Fame. She's in the Hall of Fame, too. So, you know, she's she's been sort of the star of the family and certainly had a great business career. So growing up, 
um, there were expectations. Uh, there were also, I think, their example um, and the access uh, and the exposure that they provided was invaluable. But, you know, there was also pressure. And, um, you know, my parents were pretty incredible, not just with my black peers, but with all my peers. Like, you know, I didn't see a lot of my friends, black, white or whatever, who had parents quite like mine. And so um, I, I at times struggled with feeling like trying to live up to, to their success and trying to live up to what they've accomplished. And that was you know, 12, 13, 14 years of age, you're trying to figure out who you are. You're, you know, you're going through that. You know, middle school is not fun for anyone, I think, when you look back on it. But, you know, there's sort of like, wow, like no matter what I do, you know, they've done it, you know, on a whole nother level. And so I remember I did a science project. I don't know. I can't remember. Science fair or whatever, science project. And I remember I was talking to my mom and she was like, yeah, in 1960, whatever, she did a, she won the national science fair with her project. And <laughs> I was like, man, like I can't do anything, you know? And you, here you come with your solar system, which you always yeah. say, you got, you got Mars and you got Saturn and, and toothpicks. That'd have been something I did. <laughs> exactly. I, I'm thinking, I'm just trying to get a B minus. Like she's talking about, you know, she was, you know, the best science project in the, in the country. And so, I mean, so they, they were achievers, but you know, they always, tried to empower me. They always tried to, you know, my mom and my dad have always been my biggest fans and supporters. And I, and I do think, and I talk about it a little bit in the book, but I think, I think basketball kind of helped validate it, it. It defined me. It gave me confidence um, and really helped me grow into who I became. And, um, but yeah, no question. They were, they were achievers. And that was like, whoa, like this is, you know, Yale. I'm just That's trying to, I'm yeah. just, yeah, I'm just trying to like not have C's on my report card, you know. And, and yeah. well, in your own right, and I'm sure they tell you this, you are so accomplished. And you talk about, um, I mean, look, part owner of a team, um, art collector that is that 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 people know of. I'll get into that, but but not only that, um, an author, right? You have a book, you have a memoir, game, and I think for me, that has to be one of the hardest things to do to sit down and write about yourself and, and be very honest and authentic and know that people will read it and, and judge you. And you do talk about confidence and how um, the game of basketball gave you that. I always thought, this is my observation. I am not a psychologist, but watching <laughs> you, watching you in college, watching you play, there was always this quiet, um, and I don't want to say brooding because that wasn't the, but contemplation. I always felt like you were consistently in thought and not just about the game, but just like heavy thought. And I always wondered what was going through your mind during that time. And I don't know if it was that you might've been frustrated with injuries, right? Um, I don't know if you ever thought that people, you know, if you got the respect that you deserved, I don't, I don't know, but I always thought you were always contemplating. Am I wrong? No, you can be honest because I, I could be wrong. No, no, <laughs> no. I'm. Not, I think I'm a thinker. I think I, I, you know, I think personality. wise I mean, look, I'm in media, so you know, right. we're, we're we're paid to talk and have an opinion. And, um, but I, I think my nature is is to be to myself and somewhat introverted. Um, and if I'm in a public setting, I'm more at ease and more comfortable observing and and. Um, you know, instead of being on, you know, like that, I can do it, but that's not something where, you know, like we talked about Charles, Charles likes to hold court. Like he, he gets energy from doing that. Yeah. That, that is draining to me. And, <laughs> and so I think that combined with being an only child, like you're accustomed to, to being lost in your thoughts. And, and sometimes that, that can, you know, that can be a hindrance, you know, like that can, can you can get you know too caught up in in over analyzing things and and looking at things from every standpoint, um, but yeah, I mean, I think I'm I'm I think by nature that's who I am. Um, I think at different stages of my career, um, you know, when I got hurt and I came back, I mean, you know, early on in my career, my my career was was kind of all over the map in terms of what I experienced, but. Um, you know, I, I, there, there was a there was an interesting, 
how do I put it? Um, I was I was kind of uncomfortable with the limelight and the attention. Um, I didn't run from it. I didn't do Tim Duncan and just keep quiet and play. I leveraged it. I monetized it. You know, I made money off of it, but it was never something that that I was comfortable with. And and so part of that is I'm, I'm private. Part of that is I just don't like the attention on me. Uh, and so what do I do? I write a book, <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I, 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 I think you're pretty close to that. I think, I think that's a good assessment if you were no, to describe but what, what you just said makes sense, right? You, you, maybe there was a discomfort. Maybe that's what I was thinking. I was like, I don't think he likes all this attention. However, however, for someone who doesn't like all the attention, it came to you in, in a huge way. Um, the face of NCAA, you know what I mean? The face of you know, the NBA at one point, right? You come out and, and people, there's, there, there was no wrong that you could do in my opinion. And I felt like either he's uncomfortable with this or this is a lot of pressure. Or maybe it is all of the above, but then Grant, you have an acting career. You popping up on TV shows on my little favorite sitcoms and stuff. <laughs> so I was like, he going to be an actor. Why you, why, why you, why you, why you acting if you uncomfortable? Tell me, tell me, tell me. Why are you an actor? I mean, you know, I, I think I think I realized. So it was interesting. I was with my handlers as I was. <laughs> no, I was with my people before the draft and the summer before my rookie year. And I remember, you know, one, they said you have a chance to be a brand. And I didn't understand what that meant. I knew what a brand was. I knew like, you know, I equated a brand to McDonald's or Nike or, or whatever. I didn't think an individual was a brand, you know, it just shows right. you how much, you know, everyone now is very brand awareness, uh, yeah. you know, conscious yeah. of their brand. But back then that was something that, I, you know, I had to process. And then I remember like, you know, I remember like, I want, I, I said to everybody, I said, I, I want to know and I want to feel what it's like to be Michael Jordan. Mm. And mm. what I meant by that was to me, he embodied excellence. He won. Um, he was the darling of Madison Avenue. He was the face of the league. And so to me, he was the standard and, and really kind of, you know, has been sort of the standard ever since. I mean, LeBron and others have been able to take that maybe and go to a whole nother level in some respects, but like Jordan was the gold standard. And, and so, um, so to me that, that meant I was, do, I was, you know, I was on a, a trajectory of, of success. I was going to be, go down as maybe one of the greatest. And so all that that encompassed was what I wanted, or at least I told myself I wanted. But then as I got into it, I wasn't like, I, I didn't necessarily enjoy all of it. I didn't enjoy all the attention. I didn't enjoy, you know, going out and, and all eyes on me. Um, you know, I, I had a, a bucket list. You have to go on like living single. Like you have, you know, and so <laughs> a funny story with that is that so, they, they, they asked me to come on. I said I would do it. I flew out to L.A. And, you know, they, they'd have a, a table reading like on a Thursday. So they send the script to the hotel and <laughs> and uh, I don't read it. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to read it. We got a whole week of rehearsal. So I show up at the reading. And as we're going through it, I'm like, oh, crap. Like, I'm in a lot of scenes. Like, I'm like, I'm sitting there like, and then I have to like, I got a kiss and I got a, they got me singing. Like I'm sitting there like, how am I going to pull this off? Like I had, I was like, I was, and so then it hit me. I was like, it's like, I don't think I can do this. Like, and I remember I called my agent and I was like, I need to back out of this. Like the, it's too much. And they were like, it's too late. They've already committed. You know, they're on a site, they're on a, a schedule. And so everybody was great. You know, Dana, Queen, uh, Queen Latifah, she was awesome, the whole set. Um, but like, you know, I'm not a, like, I wasn't a PDA guy. Like I, at that point, like I, I I didn't hold hands. I never like, I didn't like to kiss in front of people. Like, you know, and now, you know, <laughs> so we go through the week, we rehearse. And it's really funny. I had a, a multiple sort of kissing scenes with, with Queen Latifah. By but the way, the one, that was so rude of them to do that to you because they were like, let's see him differently than he normally is. That's rude. I don't like well, it. No, but you know, I don't mind. I mean, in, in the long run, being taken out of your comfort zone is a good yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And so, 
but we never rehearsed the kiss. <laughs> there was one kiss where we're on the couch and it was like one of those things where like you just kind of stare, stare at each other and then you just go for it. And, but we never went for it in rehearsal. And, and so I didn't know, like, is this a real kiss? Is this a fake kiss? Like, I didn't know. You didn't ask, oh, wait, time this. out, time out, time out. I need a 15. You didn't ask those questions. You didn't say, do I have to look at you and then go do a real kiss? Because I would think, I would establish that first. Like, is it tongue? Is it not tongue? Like, you didn't ask those questions? No, that, that okay. wasn't, you know, that wasn't established. And, um, and maybe I just, you know, like I said, I didn't want to act like I didn't know what was happening. So I just kind of went with the flow. Uh, and so, and then the scene was, I won't say whether it was a real kiss or not. I, I'll, you know, out of respect, I won't say what that was or that, anything. That, 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 uh, okay. I will <laughs> say that the scene was, we, 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 we kissed to, 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 to dark. So it went to commercial and they were going to cue us when, when, when it was done. So, so we never rehearsed that. We just rehearsed up until then. So then. I can't believe I'm telling the story. But anyway, so then we actually live studio audience. We're in the midst and then they don't cue us. And so it's like for a minute and and like it. <laughs> so there would be. So anyway, that so thankfully we only had to do it one time. But anyway, I say all that to say that, like, I was not a PDA guy. I was not someone like acting. And here I am like in every scene. And um, and every once in a while, they, they replay it because I, you know, you'll see on Twitter people will talk about oh the, the Latifa scene and you know whatever whatever. But um, but yeah, I mean that 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 was my... you kissed her for a minute and they didn't cue you guys to stop. Yes, I think that might have been. I think she might have said, "Don't cue me." Look, I I, I, I don't know fine. what happened. Like I said, I was fine. a guest. I was, was a guest. She was like, "He fine," and I'm just like, "Whatever." <laughs> Well, you, don't you, know, you don't want to hear that. <laughs> no, you know, I mean, look, it was, it was, it was a fun experience. Um, and, um, you know, it was, like I said, it was one of those bucket lists. I will say this. I was never asked to come back and ask. Okay. So, <laughs> so clearly it was a one and done uh, opportunity. Don't mind me. I am silly. I am having too much fun with this story. I totally understand that. I have... You know, the nature of the business, people ask you to act and you're like, I'm not an actor. And so when they ask us to do these things that take us out of our comfort zone, I don't like it. I know I agree with you. It makes me I was like, I can be myself, but that's not because like it's not the same. It's two different things. But I'm also looking. You were on an episode of Home Improvement. Um, you had you did a lot of little things. And so all of these things, not necessarily your favorite, but you did them because you thought that was what was required of you at the time. Could we get you in a Tyler Perry movie at this moment as an actor? If Tyler Perry came to you and said, Grant, my man, listen, got this yeah, role yeah. Good for you. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I, I've I've grown uh, since then. And uh, as long as, <laughs> as, an as, actor? Long as it was, as long as it, just in, in general, like I, okay. I, I'm more comfortable, you know, I was young, I was 22 uh, on Living Single, but, uh, okay. Look, I was in, I was actually in a small part um, in a Will Packer movie. Um, mm, which one? The movie um, with Taraji Henson, uh, What What Women Want, No, What Men oh. Want. Oh, okay, okay. And okay. there was a, a poker scene with Shaq and me and yeah, a few other people. That. And we, we um, so that was, and I actually, you know, I'm not proud of this, but I actually cursed. So it was, it was kind of funny seeing me like, kind of like go off like I did. Um, but that was fun to, to see the whole process. And Will's a good friend of mine and Will kind of, you know, allowed me to be in a movie, although it was a real small part and he hasn't asked me to come back. So hey, clearly <laughs> once again, a one and done, but you know what? I can check it off and say that, that, that I did it. So I'm cool. Hollywood with is on notice. Grant is ready. He is, he is willing to, to put himself out there. Do you, okay. So you said you had to curse. Do you curse in general? Never. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 from time to time, I will. I, I try not to, but you know, sometimes you, you just, it comes out. Do you drink? Oh yeah. Okay. Now here's a funny thing. Here's a funny thing. Okay. I didn't drink until I met my wife. Oh lord. And okay. and so that sounds horrible when you say like you know I didn't, 
But no, seriously, like I, I didn't drink. Like I went through college and my first couple of years, I didn't drink at all. And and then one day she said, we have to change this. If we're going to survive, we're going to have to change this. And so so now, yeah, I'll you know have the occasional cocktail. I love her for that because that's <laughs> real. I don't trust nobody who don't drink. Just get around me as they use it. I used to be in a relationship with somebody for a very long time and he never drank. And I'd be like, at least take a sip of wine. Don't have me out here by myself looking crazy. So I appreciate, I appreciate that she um she made you have a cocktail or two. Speaking of your wife, beautiful, beautiful voice, beautiful soul, beautiful to me, a head to toe. How did you all meet? Um we we met. So, you know, to me, it was, it was from Windsor, Ontario, which is, uh, I like to say it's a suburb of Detroit. It is. Um, it is. <laughs> and uh, even though it's a, you know, foreign, it's Canada. But Correct. she, um, so it actually kind of started, Isaiah Thomas, my second year, was getting his jersey retired at the Palace. And um, Anita Baker sang the national anthem. And so afterwards, there was a reception at the Palace and, you know, I went up there and all the old bad boys were there and I got a chance to meet her and her, her then husband. And so, you know, she, she was, I don't know, somehow the conversation, she was like, oh, I'm sure you're breaking all the hearts or, you you know, whatever you got a girl, you know, and I was like, nah, you need to hook me up. Just kind of casually saying that, jokingly saying that. And so I, I think a week later, Anita Baker was at, I don't know, Soul Train Awards, one of the award shows, and she met Tamia. And this is when Tamia first came out I think she was on Quincy's album. Uh, you put a move in my heart. And um, to me, I said, I, I'm from the area. I grew up a big fan of yours. And so Anita was like, oh, I know just the person for you. Blah, blah, blah. This is who it is. And so um, to me, I swear she didn't know who I was at that time. But I'm like, yeah, right. Um, I'm joking when I say that. <laughs> um, so, you, yeah, I mean, I would be like, yeah, right, too. Like, oh, you don't know yeah, me. She's, so fast forward, <laughs> we met in Detroit maybe later that year. And um we um yeah, I mean we've we've you know pretty much been together ever since ninety six. We met in May of ninety six and you know, it was interesting. Like I, I, I didn't think that I was gonna jump into a relationship, a serious relationship. Um, you know, I just I felt like to to be an elite player um, you know, it was a sacrifice and a dedication. And I didn't know if I could manage having a relationship. So I, I think I was going to do the Derek Jeter thing. Like that was sort of what, you know, before Derek Jeter, I'm older than Derek, but like, I was just going to sort of casually date until I was older and then settle down. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, you make plans and God laughs. And, mm -hmm. and so, um, but we instantly were smitten and, and kind of fell in love and got into a relationship. And, um, and, and that wasn't what I thought, but you know, you, 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 you instantly, when you meet somebody and you know, it's right, it's right. And it was interesting. Cause like, you know, we got young, we got married, we got married in 99. She was 24. I was 25, 26. And, and I think there were people, even friends of mine were like, why are you getting married? Mm. Like, dude, like, what are you doing? You know? And, and, uh, <laughs> and, um, and, uh, but it was, you know, it was, it was when, you know, you know, and, um, and so it's been an incredible journey and 23 years, we just celebrated last week. Yay. Congratulations. And, um, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. And so, you know, we've, I, I couldn't imagine, you know, going through the injuries and the struggles and the, the highs and the lows. Uh, and then, you know, conversely with her, like, you know, what she's gone through, she's, in, you know, she has a book, she has a story. Sure. Uh, sure. And, um, but it's been, um, it's been fun. It's been a blast. Our kids are, you know, are older now, 20 and, and 15. What? Um, so parenthood is, has been great and watching them grow and, and then sort of looking ahead, you know, like you, you empty nesters, you know, like now you kind of get your life back a little bit, you know, and you can do things. And, uh, and so, but it's been, it's been awesome. And so I, I always, when I see Anita Baker, I thank her. And, uh, um, what a great story. 
Anita Baker hooked us up. And then you guys just so happened, you had met her before. She had her own situation. Situation's over. Like, this is a story, first of all, like, again, I go back to the beginning of the podcast when I tell you you're a rare breed. Because I couldn't imagine being in the NBA, being 24 years old, having access to just about any, in terms of dating, anybody you could date. Like, because that's probably what it was for you. And your friends are like, dude, you're going to get married. What? You giving up all of this? You giving up this? You giving up this lifestyle? And it's almost like, I always laugh because men act like um, when their homeboy gets married, it's like, they put them in front of a fire range and the good times are over. Like, man, yeah, I guess you, it's a funeral. It's a funeral for the, <laughs> the guy. Your friends act like it's a funeral when you get married. <laughs> and the women are like, I'm so excited. It's so exciting. Right. But I was so beautiful. It's a beautiful story. And what's even better, you know, and nothing's perfect, but it's always a beautiful story to see <clears throat> a couple in the limelight make it. Because it cannot be easy doing it in the, in, without having fame. You know what I mean? So imagine doing it with fame. I, I, I couldn't imagine how difficult it was for you all at that time. Um, and then I know in your book, you talk about this, and you just mentioned it, the injuries and all you went through. You played 19 years? Yep. 19 years. Was there a time that you wanted to and share this with them when you really thought I want to retire before the 19 years or you kept going back because you felt like I still have more to give the game. Yeah. You know, there was only a, a, a real small window where I thought about retiring and, and that was, you know, after my, you know, I had a staph infection and, you know, was septic and the whole ordeal that was, that was tough. Um, for like two or three months, I was like, you know what? I almost died because of my, you know, desire to play and, you know, maybe some incompetent medical advice uh, in there as well. And it's not, you know, it's not worth it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I was pretty relentless about wanting to get back and play. And I think, you know, I think, I think one, I love, I love the game. You know, I love playing and, and I knew that once you walk away from it, like it's over mm -hmm. and something you commit your whole life to and something you are passionate about. And, um, and just, to, you know, I, I think for anyone just in general to retire, it's not an easy transition. And so like, I wanted to exhaust everything before I walked away. And uh, so in the midst of all of that, you know, I kept saying like, okay, I'm going to make up for it on the back end. I'm gonna play till I'm 40. And I, I promise you the day I turned 40, my last year with the Clippers, I hurt my knee. And now it was, it was the, th the third knee injury in a year, but it was like, like it was the third knee injury on the same knee, but I heard it and I was out for like three or four months. And it was like, man, like I used to always say when I'm, I'm, I'm going to make up for it and play till I'm 40. And the day I turn 40, I get hurt. Yeah. And so I should have yeah. said, I should have said 50. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I, um, yeah, no, I mean, I just, I forgot the question. Forgive me. I'm going on a no, tangent, just, but, um, it's just like, sometimes it's hard to walk away from something you love. And, and I said, did you ever feel, you said when you had staph infection and you thought for oh, a yeah. brief time, and then you kept playing because you felt like you had something to give the game or you just loved it. You couldn't imagine your life without that routine, without the travel, like that becomes a, that becomes addictive and it just becomes your lifestyle. You think, what am I going to do now? Like that's a real serious question for a lot of athletes who who retire, who walk away from the game. Like, what's next for me? You know what I mean? Well, yeah. I mean, I think okay, a couple of things. Yes, no, no question. The desire to keep playing, and um, I think as I did transition into retirement, um, and really the process of writing this book, and even just kind of living with the book, and then you know, kind of building up to the release of the of the book. You know, I think this, you know, I think I realized that in sort of time to unpack some things, I got a lot on my plate and a lot that I'm doing. And I think a lot of that has to do with maybe things not ending or going the way I would have liked to, them to have gone during my career. Yeah. And so this like incredible drive to like succeed and, and to, to accomplish something. And, you know, 
Tamia sometimes would joke like early in retirement. She's like, man, I thought retirement was like, you know, a rocking chair and lemonade. And and I was going and hustling. Like she said, you're, you're hustling like you're broke. Like, you know, and and I would just, you know, got to stay hungry and, you know, you got to strike while the iron's hot or whatever cliche you use. Like I, I just, and now that I kind of take time to survey everything and I, and I like where I'm at and I like what I'm doing, but yeah. I feel like, I feel like I didn't deal with sort of what happened or what didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And I think as a result, yeah. And so there's like this, like, I didn't, I didn't win championships. I didn't stay on this trajectory of where I was going with my career. And really the process of writing the book really kind of helped me realize that. Um, And so I think this drive, like, and so the drive, you know, look, drive can be good. You know, we, we reward ambition, we reward achievement. Um, but I haven't, I, I'm learning to, to the work-life balance part. And that's something I don't think I've done a good job of. And so I'm trying to sort of correct that and be more intentional about, you know, it's okay to work hard, but it's also, you know, you got to have balance in your life. Um, and and so, um, so anyway, the book, I think, helped me with, you know, coming to that realization a bit. The, I, I, I can't even understand what it would mean, right, to win on the collegiate level, and we'll talk about college and broad strokes in a minute for me, the college game and your contribution, um, but not to win on a professional level seems to be painful for so many players. But then I look at players like Kobe, and he still regrets not be, getting one over Jordan. You know what I mean? Like, may he rest in peace. That was his, like, God, I hate I had to retire before I, could, I couldn't even get the number the same or one over Jordan. So do you think most players feel that way? Or is it a special type of player, like a, a Grant Hill or a, <clears throat> I think of great players like Vince Carter who didn't win, or even Chuck for that matter. He didn't win a chip. If, and But they contribute to the game in such a way, and they're still Hall of Famers as you are and still considered the best um, at what they did during that time. Um, do you ever make peace with the fact that you didn't get a championship on the, in the NBA? Yeah, you know, I, I, you know, I, I can't speak for those. I mean, I know Vince and, and Chuck very well. I, I don't, I haven't had a sort of a, a deep, naked conversation with them on this subject matter. But I, I can speak for myself. I mean, I thought I had, I, I thought I was good. Like I thought that I was at peace with my career and what happened and what unfolded. And I think I realized that maybe I'm not totally at peace and there's that void and okay what do you replace that void with and you know some people can have a void in something and you know it can be something toxic or something dangerous it can be drugs out whatever I mean but I just think like I think I like I said in recent years I realized like it's it's this like incredible desire to prove myself to myself you know, in a way. And, and so learning to kind of manage that Mm. and, um, and, you know, understanding that, because I think what happens, I mean, I can't speak for those guys, but I think, I think sometimes we naturally focus on what we, we didn't do, you know, or what we don't have. And, and as opposed to really sort of having a, a feeling of gratitude and appreciation for what you do have. And, you know, when I was in Detroit and, you know, I was doing all these things and I had a lot of individual success and um, on and off the court, I didn't give myself permission to enjoy it because we weren't winning. We weren't like we didn't win. And I blamed myself for us not winning. So I didn't really like appreciate the good and appreciate what was happening. Um, and, you know, to me, like, it, like at Duke, whether you love or hate Duke, whatever, I mean, that, that's one thing, but like, it was all about winning. And that was what we were conditioned to believe. Like, I didn't care about individual stats. You know, I didn't care. Like, it was just whatever we have to do to win. And then I go into the NBA 
and all this other stuff, which is great. But I didn't care about like to me, the most important thing was winning and we weren't winning. And so I couldn't enjoy all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. And and so the, the writing of the book forces you to go back and live in certain moments and live, you know, and confront things good and bad about your past. I didn't appreciate how good I was. I mean, that sounds real arrogant, but like I didn't appreciate how good I was when I was in Detroit because we weren't winning. And now I go back at it and I look at it and even watching old tapes, I would watch games to kind of conjure up, you know, memories and things, whatever. And I'm like, damn, I was actually all right. Like I was, you know, I'm looking at it like, uh, I was, you know, and, more than I, <laughs> no, but I'm saying I, I didn't see that or I didn't look at it that way at the time because I'm chasing Isaiah. You know, Isaiah was the gold standard. I'm chasing I looked at Isaiah's banner before every game. Like that to me was what I was pursuing and anything less was, was, you know, was, 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 uh, you know, a failure. And so, and so anyway, to go back, you know, look at it through a different lens with, a, with, you know, greater appreciation. Um, you know, it, it was, it was surprising. I didn't expect it, but it was almost one of those things was like, whoa, like, yeah. Okay. And, and I, I, in a way I kind of needed that. Like I needed to see that and realize that because, you know, I, I looked at, you know, those years as, you know, as, as almost a failure, it's a total failure. Mm. So anyway, I don't know if I'm making sense, but. No, um, you're making complete sense. Everything you're saying is in, in, to me, let me mirror this back for a second. Cause this is a message no matter when we're in the midst of whatever it is we're trying to achieve, we're doing such great things, but we're such a society of more, 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 more. And we don't know how to appreciate the moment as opposed to thinking about more and more and more. And I think that goes across every field, whether you're an NBA player, you're a journalist, you're a, you, you know, you're a corporate work, whatever it is, you're a producer, whatever it may be. Um, and then you look back on it because on the outside looking in, like I, 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 you know, I would be hard pressed to tell you that you didn't help me love college basketball. It would be a lie. When I, when I, when I think about why I fell in love with college basketball, even before I got to college, it was because of players like you and Christian Leitner and, and you can go, go fab five, like you can go down a list, right. Of like why I fell in love with this amateur, you know, in air quotes game. And and it was because of you, like you were, you're a part of what I call Americana, right? That's pop culture. If we did a book on what the NCAA was and what it is today or how glorious and pure it seemed back then before we all knew what it was, you would be in that book. And so my, and so my question for you now, like you look at the college game, Coach K just retired. I know that you have an affinity for him. I'm watching him, Roy Williams, Jay Wright, all of these OGs, these coaches, right? For folks who are listening, Jay Wright had co was head coach at Villanova, Roy Williams at UNC, uh, at Coach K, Duke. You're watching these coaches retire within a matter of a year or two of one another, but whatever. It's because the, the game has changed, all pun intended, because that's the name of your book. So you look at the game now with NIL, right? What do you think about the college. These deals are getting crazy and I'm not mad, but I'm like, what does that mean? These kids have agents now before they even get to, to play their very first game. How do you feel about that? Well, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the state of intercollegiate athletics and, and, and really basketball, I think in college football in general um, is changing and it's changing so quickly and rapidly that it's, it's kind of hard to, to process. Um, I think the game has really changed and evolved even prior to NIL. Uh, you talked about that sort of golden era in the nineties, early nineties and, you know, UNLV, Vegas, us, oh, yeah, you know, UCLA, about, yeah. yes, all yeah. these great teams, um, you know, guys were there for more than one year. Mm -hmm. And so whether you, loved or hated Duke or loved or hated Carolina or loved or hated the Fab Five, you watched them over multiple years and you saw, you know, you saw that story unfold. And now in an era where, you know, these great guys and, you know, leaving early, one and done, you just don't have the same emotional attachment or connection with, with, with these teams because these players aren't there long enough. And now you throw in NIL, you throw in the transfer portal, 
Um, you know, I'm hearing that things, you know, in California, they may try to enact a law with, you know, making it legal for pay for play at, at California universities, um, which would even change it even more so. And so it's, it's, it's kind of going bonkers. It's like the wild, wild west right now. And I think everybody is trying to figure out how to play in that sandbox. But you're seeing, you know, Roy Williams, Coach K, Jay Wright, in the span of one year, all these legends, these icons who've really contributed to the game um, and have been hugely successful. I think part of it was age. I think Coach K is, is time. But, you know, Jay Wright was still young. Jay Wright still had a lot of runway. And- yeah, well, he well, is he or he's 60? Is that young? Yeah, I mean, he, you know, he's got another at least five years, you okay. know, and and and, and so it, it's it's scary, you know, and 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 I don't know what the future looks like. I don't know what five years from now looks like, um, but I think I think you potentially you see it, you know, UCLA, USC. I know you're in California, going into the Big Ten now. Yeah, you know, some of that tradition that um, has been a part of college sports with the realignment and, and such it's changing and you know it's it's you know i'm all for players having an opportunity to to profit um you know and i I remember i I remember i I wanted to buy my jersey from the duke bookstore and i wanted to give it to my dad for five i don't know give it to him for christmas or whatever Mm -hmm. and i went into the bookstore and it was like 120 dollars for me to buy my jersey and you know i couldn't go to the athletic department to have them give me a jersey because that's a violation. And so I wasn't thinking like, okay, I want a piece of the money that they're making off my, I just wanted to be able to get my own jersey for free. Like that was what I was thinking in 1992. And- um, Wait a second, in 1992, your jersey was a hundred and how much dollars to go buy for your dad? It was a hundred and something dollars. And I remember I bought it for my dad and um, and it just, it dawned on me like, wow, I, like. Mm-hmm. Like, I wasn't even thinking like, man, like they're making this. I was just like, I got to pay for my own jersey. Like I didn't, that, that didn't sit right with me. And now you fast forward to some of these NIL deals where guys are making, you know, they're making more money than the professionals make in some cases. And, mm-hmm. and so it's. Rightfully you know, so though. I No, 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 I, no. I, I'm saying, so, so it's, but it's an interesting yeah. dynamic. No, no, I'm not saying it's, it's wrong. I'm just saying it's an interesting dynamic. And I think people don't know how to take it and really how to navigate it. And so it's changing the landscape. It's changing as a coach, how you recruit, how you prepare, how you, you know, when I came up, um, you know, Coach K signed Christian Leitner uh, one year. Then he signed Bobby Hurley the next year. Then he signed me. And he felt like he had his, his big, his point guard, and then his wing player. And he, you know, he filled in around that. And, you know, it gave us a chance to be successful. Well, obviously, you know, one and done, you can't prepare that way. At least he hasn't in the last decade. Um, so you, you have to adapt and adjust with the times, which he did a great job of. But I think moving forward in football and basketball, and really in all sports, you know, these collectives, you know, our alumni, are they going to get involved and contribute? Are you going to allocate money for athletes? Like it's, it's, it requires you to adapt and adjust if you want to be successful. And, uh, and so it's a little bit scattered. It's a little bit of the wild, wild west, but I do think in time, I'm hopeful that it'll kind of, you know, it'll get to a point where everyone can operate in this new model that's been created. I think it's very, I think what you said was probably the, the most simple but most articulate thing, it's hard to respond because you don't know what it is. But you are correct in terms of it's getting more complicated. And that's why I think I'm seeing, like, I, that's why I think Jay Wright left. I'm a guest. I just feel like he was like, I don't want to deal with that. This this is not the game that I know. And if I have to start being um, uh, someone who is an expert on NIL deals, that part I can't give my brain to, right? I just want to mm-hmm. focus on the X's and O's and get a chip. That part get so complicated because it's so new and there are no strict rules yet. There's the loopholes and kids can do this and kids could do that. And you talk about UCLA, I went to UCLA, UCLA and USC, right? They go to the Big Ten, they want more money. But when I hear you tell me 
1992, your jersey cost $120 and you just wanted it for free. I get infuriated. I get so angry. And shout out to my man, Ed O'Bannon, who I know could have used that money and still could to this day use that money, right? Like as he as he put him himself and, you know, quote unquote, on the line to have, have this happen as it is. I think it's really interesting how it will affect the player themselves. I think you're right. I'm not invested in teams anymore. I don't know these kids' names. Like you do because you probably cover the tournaments, but you have to learn them before. I remember watching, you know, Chuck and, and, and Kenny talk about these kids, and it's, it's a new one, a new star every year. You don't know these kids. Who are you? Okay, who is this? You know how, it, okay, y'all behind the scenes, you get research packets, and you're like, so what's his name? And what do you, you know, because it's so, it, it just, the turnover is quick. You don't know who they, it's so fast, the one and done. Um, and that's what I, I will miss, right? I will say I will miss that because I am not invested like I used to be. Like I could watch you, I literally, March Madness was my thing. Like I, that was where I wanted to be. Watching you win two chips, great. W watching UCLA, even when I was there. Like this is, I was invested. Um, and now I find, like all things, one thing is constant, all things change. So you look at the league, NBA, all these players want to do is get to the league, get to the league, get to the league. And LeBron has changed the game. You mentioned him. Has he changed the game for the better? Amon Shumpert is quoted as saying, LeBron fucked it up for everybody when he went to Miami. <laughs> Remember? So um, you, what do you think about this new NBA? And we're going to give to the old man LeBron. Has he, has, he, has he made it for the better or for the worse? Well, you know, look, I, I also, I wear many hats and, and one of them is, you know, co-owner, vice chairman of, of the Atlanta Hawks. Particular? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. Like, don't get me in trouble, Carrie. Okay. No, 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 no. But I mean, I, I, I think, look, I mean, as you said, all things, I, I, you said it better than I'm going to say it, but you know, all things change and things grow and evolve. And as it relates to the NCAA, it's going through growth and, and change. And sometimes that can be painful, but also sometimes that's necessary. And LeBron, you know, look, LeBron, his accomplishments on the court speak for themselves. Uh, I think he came around in this sort of digital social media age, which um, I think has, has been good and bad in some respects. Good in the sense that it only amplifies and, um, you know, creates this connection and relationship with fans, gives him a voice. He doesn't need to go through you know, a journalist to speak to an audience or to the world. Um, I also think there's some some tough parts where you hear all the noise and you hear the backlash, you hear the hate, or you see the hate, or you read the hate. Um, you know, when I played, you know, really it was only, you know, the print media and, and you know, sports talk radio. And, you know, there was a gauntlet of, editors that, you know, had to, 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 you know, to read through things before they were printed. And, you know, I didn't necessarily listen to talk radio or sports talk radio in the nineties. Now, you know, someone can say LeBron, you know, and say something bad about his mom or, or his, his wife or his kids. And these players today see that. Mm -hmm. And, and so that that's hard and we didn't have to endure that, but you know, I, I do think he stood on the shoulders of Michael Jordan and he, he took it to another level in terms of ownership, in terms of control, um, you know, in terms of really leveraging this platform you have in the NBA. The NBA is a global media and public relations firm. That's what they do well. They promote and market players all over the world. Uh, I remember when I did Inside Stuff and yeah. uh, with, with Kristen Ledlow, we did it yeah. for a few years and, you know, we would, <laughs> we would tape it. First of all, she's a pro. I was learning at the time, but you were still great. Hour, well, I appreciate it. It was, it was a half hour show. It would take us like an hour and a half to tape. Like literally. And most, <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Yeah, it was okay. But we got there. We got to the finish line, but they would do an international ending to the show every oh. week. And oh. And we would always kind of roll our eyes like, oh, why do we have to do this? And blah, blah, blah. It was like a generic ending. 
And then I went to South Africa with my wife and we were there in like 2016 and it was October. So before the basketball season and they're playing inside stuff in the hotel room. And like, I'm going around, you know, Johannesburg and people are calling me Mr. Inside Stuff. And so like, to me, it's just like, and so when we came back, we're like, hey, we got to get these international goodbyes, you right? Get this right. Yeah, you know, <laughs> like, let's ever get my makeup done. Whatever. But like, it just speaks to how global the game is. And, and, and LeBron, um, so, you know, I, I think the game's in a good place. I, I think LeBron is sort of a one of a kind athlete in a lot sure. of ways. I don't know if we'll have another kind of LeBron who, who just understands his power and his value. And I think, strategically made moves that um, really elevated his profile uh, and his bottom line uh, along the way. So I, I don't think it's a problem. I mean, look, I, I tried to leave and, and go to Orlando and Tim Duncan was going to go and Tracy McGrady. And, mm -hmm. you know, obviously Duncan didn't go and, and, and I, you know, I was hurt, but um, so leaving and going to Miami, um, he has that right. You know, he gets criticized, I think, for it. But he has that right to do that as every player. And look, when my dad played, just understand this. So my dad played for the Cowboys. And he left to go to the World Football League, and which was a new upstart league in 75, I think around 74, 75. He got sued by the Cowboys. Which is crazy. And, crazy. and he ended up countersuing and went and he won. But – that was a period where athletes didn't have the right to, they didn't have free agency. You weren't allowed to go elsewhere when your contract expired. That team owned your rights. They could trade you, but you didn't have that opportunity. So, you know, yeah, I mean, we're standing on the shoulders of, of, of giants who paved the way and, and, and made those sacrifices. So he had every right to go to Miami. You may not like how he went about it, but, you know, he had every right to do that. And he had every right to go back to Cleveland and go to LA. And, um, but, you know, he, he's been an incredible player, an incredible ambassador. He's delivered on the expectations, maybe mm -hmm. even exceeded them, mm -hmm. which is very rare, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with someone who came in with as much fanfare as he did. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he's going to be missed when he's gone, when he retires and walks away. The um, NBA, television rights, everything is going to take a hit. You're going to see dips. Say what you want. He's the most loved to be hated and the most hated to be loved. But I'm telling you at this moment, he, and I'm not saying that just because he plays for the Lakers, but I will tell you, I'm the typical fan. I couldn't stand him until he became a Laker. I was like, oh, guys, I think you guys are too hard on LeBron. <laughs> I think everyone's too hard on LeBron. They're like, but just last week you hated him. I said, that's not the point. That's not the point. <laughs> but right. you are correct. He has taught, what he has taught every player is that they have leverage and that they yeah. can, if, if in fact they can produce on the court and they have, and they do, and they are a Grand Hill, if you will, he has leverage. And he was fearless. He was fearless. He moved fearlessly. He has moved fearlessly in this league and, ta and taken all the hits. And while, I think time will tell his story in the way in which you all, you and I see him. Um, I, I often wonder how much has that affected his psyche? Cause I'm sure it has his family as well. He acts like it's not a big deal, but you got, you got to, but like you said, he can hear it. He can see it. He could read it. Now they're going after your kids. They're not just going after you. They're going after your wife. They're going after your kids. I'm like, hands off. Like to me, there's just, you draw the line some places. You don't talk about people's families. You know what I mean? Right. That's just, that's no, what no, I mean. No, I, I agree. But I, I think what happens is, is that, I, you know, and, and I don't know if this applies to LeBron, but I think I think a lot of guys, they hear the noise, they see the noise, and they they put everybody in the same bucket. And, you know, and so, and you become cynical. And, and you know, like there's credible journalists out there who I think, have integrity uh, and I think want to get to a deeper meaning and really want to be objective. But I think there's a lack of trust with some of the athletes today with some members of the media. And I think some of it stems from just the noise and, and all that. And so you, you become defensive. You're not as old. Like there was a relationship. Like I'll give you an example. So I, I, I cover, I do games for TNT mm -hmm. and back in the day when, you know, when, when, when they would come and broadcast a game, you'd sit down for an interview. Mm -hmm. and they would play that interview clip during the game. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen anymore. 
Mm-mm. And and it's almost like one in part because whatever needs to be said, they can just say it, you know, on their own platforms. They don't need to to talk with. But it's just a, it's an interesting dynamic, and um, I think there's just a lot of noise and a lot of criticism, uh, and and I think it's it's sensationalized a bit, and I think it plays on the mental psyche of athletes, and um, no question, and 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 that's something I, I I'm not a fan of. Mm. I'm with you. I'm in agreement. I, 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 but you know, I'm also guilty, but I'm in agreement. I mean, I'm also guilty of talking out the side of my neck every now and again. So I try, I try, I learn from my mistakes. I gotta be honest, like, cause I've never played the game. So I can't, I can't say certain things. There are certain things I can't say. I said, I remember, and I don't know if you remember when I was on sports center, I said, I just wouldn't start my team with Kevin Durant. He doesn't have enough heart. And this is when he was with Oklahoma. And it was like, it was think pieces and she crazy. And that's why women shouldn't be on TV and send her back to the kitchen. I mean, I got roasted. There was at one point in which my producer thought, which I'm glad that we decided not to. He was like, oh, I think maybe you should apologize. And the bosses were like, no, we pay her to have an opinion. If that's her opinion, she's doing a top five list and she don't gonna add, she's not going to add Katie. That's, that's just her choice. Um, but it was really heavy. But it got even worse. That was the year that they were up 3-1 in the conference finals against Golden State. And you know mm-hmm. what happened after that, right? They lost. Right. And then he right. went to Golden State. And then there was all this conversation about, well, maybe she wasn't wrong, <laughs> right? And it, But at the same time, it was more of a personal attack as opposed to statistically or professionally or on the court why I wouldn't choose him. Right. That taught me that if I do have a criticism, I have to keep it on the court. It ain't about you not this you not this goon, if you will. Like right. talk about what it looks like. So so having said that, you're right. I don't blame them for being the new media. The new media now, Grant, ain't you and me, well, kinda, because I because I say what I want on my podcast, but the new media is the I am athlete podcast and the pivots of the world and the uninterrupted of the world. These are, they're like, okay, we're going to flip, the, you know, and they, and they're missing some very tangible parts. Very few athletes. You're one of the few, I think, and I'm going to tell you this, that could play the game and then be an impartial journalist. That's a hard thing to learn. Like it really is a difficult spot to put you in as a player, as a former player to talk about other players, good or bad, right? It's just a tough spot. And now we're watching these guys take ownership, as you said, back. And it is, the game is changing and I, and for the better, in my opinion. So, well, well, well first of all, I just want to, to, to your point where you said, and I appreciate you, you being forthcoming and, and sharing your experience and what you said about Duran and, yeah. you know, look, there were hit jobs back in the day. I mean, Peter Vesey, yes. you know, he, was, yes. he, he went at everybody and it was personal. I think the difference is, is is technology now and particularly social media. So if you say something on air, it's going to be amplified and okay. it's going to be all over the place. And then people are going to chime in and, and, and either side with you uh, and just give it more oxygen. And so to me, you know, I, I look at, you know, Charles and those guys. I mean, Charles and those guys for 20 plus years have been, <laughs> you know, taking shots at people and being funny and humorous and so on and so forth. Um, but then with like, like the JaVel McGee situation, oh yeah, you know, that became oh, wow. something because yeah, that was bad. Not so, it was bad and it was unfortunate, but I think part of it was there's more oxygen around it. And so now you hear it, you see it, you read it, yeah. you, you see the tweets. And so that's, what's changed the game. I think in some respects, it's just all the noise, you know, that surrounds and, uh, and all the opinions that, um, you know, that at times are, are hard to run from. Grant Hill, you've given me more than enough time. Um, I'm going to um, ask Jamel for your information because I do want to check on you family-wise, make sure everything is all good. Um, But I thank you for joining us. Everybody listening, go and get this book. If you want this deep intellectual thought from this this authentic human being, it's game, you can get it anywhere, right? I can go on Amazon. I can do it on my – you did an audio book, no? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I love an audiobook because, you know, we just in a car and we got to drive and do our thing real quick. I like it. Um, and anything else you're working on you want to let people know about? Yeah, no, I mean, I, no, not right now. I, I'm um, it's, it's wherever books are sold. Like mm-hmm. you said, it's an audio version. And uh, yeah, stay tuned. There, there, there may be an opportunity to come back on Naked again here in the near future.